All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome back. In today's video, we're going to transition into our discussions about inductors and capacitors. So, goals for today's video. Our first goal is to really understand how inductors and capacitors work and how they can be used to store energy in electrical circuits. We're also going to learn some new tools for our toolbox. And so we're going to talk about the different equations and tools that we have to help us solve circuits with inductors and capacitors. And finally, we'll start talking about some real world applications where capacitors and inductors are used. So let's go ahead and get started. So just for fun, I'd like to ask a quick question here. Many of you have probably used inductors and capacitors constantly in real life. So before we start diving into all the details, it's good to recognize how common and important these components are. So take a moment and think about which of the following real life inductors and capacitors have you used? Notice we have capacitors in our camera flash. So we also have inductors, which allow our induction stove to work. If you've used wireless chargers or electric motors, those also contain inductors. And many of us have electrical devices with buttons and touchscreens, and those also leverage capacitors. Finally, radio antennas use inductors and capacitors. And even in e-ink displays, we use a capacitor and charged particles in order to mimic ink. So hopefully you've seen that inductors and capacitors are everywhere. And as we go through today's video and discuss them, keep this in mind. Think of all the important uses that inductors and capacitors have. Even if you don't end up becoming an electrical engineer, you're probably still going to run into situations where it's useful to know about inductors and capacitors. So just a reminder, let's talk about where we're heading next. We've filled our toolbox with lots of equations for DC circuits, and so in the next few lectures, we're going to start adding more components to our circuits to make them more interesting. Because the truth is, most real life circuits also contain things like capacitors, inductors, and AC sources. So let's go ahead and today focus on learning more about inductors and capacitors. Let's first start with a review of a couple important key terms. You may remember from our first couple videos, we introduced passive and active circuit elements. You might remember that passive elements are circuit elements which cannot generate electrical energy. In our case, resistors are one example of a passive element because resistors will dissipate current and energy as heat. And another example is capacitors and inductors. We will see that capacitors and inductors are actually capable of storing energy. A couple other new terms that pop up here are dynamic circuits and static circuits. A circuit which contains capacitors and inductors is sometimes called a dynamic circuit. And the reason why these are called dynamic circuits is in part because they can potentially be changing with time, so they can have time-dependent behavior. And we'll also see that these circuits are represented by differential equations. And then on the other hand, static circuits are circuits that 
do not contain capacitors or inductors. The reason we call them static is because in this case, they are not changing with time. Whereas dynamic, of course, is changing with time. So the nice thing about static circuits is that the math is easier. Static circuits can be represented by algebraic equations. So as we transition into capacitors and inductors, we'll need to start using a few tools that require differential equations. We got a couple more new key terms to introduce here. And these are transient and steady state. When we say steady state, this means we are not changing with time. Or we can say that the value is constant. Value is constant over time. However, if we happen to have transient behavior, this means that we are changing with time. And just as an example of this, we could see that a capacitor will show initially transient behavior when it's charging. And once the capacitor has fully charged, we will reach a steady state and we will have some constant voltage on our capacitor. Graphically, you can see here that the steady state part of this plot, you know, maybe this is the voltage of our capacitor. The steady state part of our graph is where we are not changing with time. And notice that in this case, if we have a capacitor charging, there will be some time dependent behavior initially. So we see that initially we have some time dependence in our voltage, and after a period of time, we stabilize to steady state. So we'll take a closer look at steady state and transient behavior starting in this video and continuing on in our next videos as well. So for those of you who like the water analogy, here's another way to look at transient and steady state behavior. So initially, if we have a still pool of water, so we have some water that is undisturbed, this water is just sitting there with constant behavior and it's not changing with time. So we could say that initially, an undisturbed pool of water is at steady state. But then suppose we were to throw a rock into that pool of water and all of a sudden we get a splash, right? And some ripples. And so if we were to throw a rock into our pool of water, it is no longer at steady state. Suddenly the water's Waves and ripples are changing with time. So now the pool of water is in a transient state. But then over time, the ripples will eventually fade and our pool of water will reach a steady state again. So this is another way to visualize transient and steady state behavior. And Interesting fact here, just a little preview. In our next videos, we're gradually going to learn more about the equations governing the behavior of circuits. And we're going to learn that some circuits can be mathematically described by the same equations as a ripple in a pool of water. It's a very common, very important mathematical equation called the 2D wave equation. So stay tuned for that.
we'll, we'll return to those equations in our future videos. There's one more important thing we want to point out before we jump in to our capacitors, and that is notation. Many circuits textbooks, including ours, often write initial conditions like this. So here this is our voltage at time t equals zero with a plus and t equals zero with a minus. So that might seem a little funny. So you want to think about this notation in terms of before and after some disturbance, where the time just before t equals zero is called t equals zero minus, and the time just after t equals zero is called t equals zero plus. Think about times when you might be like flipping a switch. Right, like initially at t equals zero minus, maybe your circuit is powered off, you have zero volts. So maybe initially our voltage is zero, but then maybe at time t equals zero, you flip the switch and you have some new voltage after. So t equals zero plus would be the instant just after time t equals zero, and time t equals zero minus would be the time right before t equals zero. So this might seem a little bit strange because the time between zero minus and zero plus is infinitely small. The reason we use this notation is because it allows us to emphasize that some parameters, like capacitor voltage and inductor current, some of these parameters cannot change instant instantaneously. So there's a mathematical discontinuity exactly at t equals zero. We'll talk more about this later on, but for now, please be aware of this, this notation because it is very commonly used when we work with steady state and transient circuits. Once again, time just before t equals zero is t equals zero minus, and right after t equals zero is time t equals zero plus. All right, so let's go ahead and transition now to capacitors. Capacitors are very important circuit components, and as we mentioned before, they are passive components. And often they're made using two parallel plates. Of course, these are conductive plates. And so in this case, the capacitor has these two parallel conductive plates and it's able to store energy in the electric field between those plates. So of course the distance D between our capacitor plates is generally quite small so that we can have that electric field. And in a circuit diagram, we see that capacitor symbols are very often parallel lines. Sometimes we use a curved line to indicate the negative end of a capacitor. So if you've done any work with capacitors before, you might remember how capacitors can be charged and discharged. So initially, if we attach a voltage source and apply some voltage 
difference across our capacitor. What ends up happening is we deposit positive charge on one plate and then we deposit negative charge on the other plate. And so basically what happens is we apply that voltage, we give the charge time to accumulate on either plate. That process is called charging the capacitor. And then sometimes in our circuit, we decide that we want to remove that voltage source. So if we were to remove the voltage source, Notice there is no longer any potential holding those charges in place. So the positive charge, positive charge is going to leave that positive plate and it's going to flow back to the negative plate. So when we discharge the capacitor, we are allowing the charge that had accumulated on those plates to basically spread back out and flow from positive plate to negative plate. So that does bring up a couple important conventions. For example, passive convention. Typically, if we are applying a voltage on our capacitor, we assume that our positive current is entering the positive terminal of our capacitor. And again, that's because we are accumulating positive charge on top of that positive plate. And negative charge is accumulating on the opposite plate. But if we discharge our capacitor, we're essentially allowing our capacitor to behave like a voltage source. And then we see that our positive charge is actually flowing away from the plate. And so we have current exiting the positive terminal when we discharge. All right, so the next thing you might be wondering is, okay, well, how much charge can we actually store in a capacitor? And the quantity that helps us determine that is capacitance. Whenever I see the word capacitance, I think of the word capacity. And of course, capacity means how much space there is or how much space there is to store stuff. And so here, when we say capacitance, we're basically describing how well our capacitor can store charge. And it, it turns out that mathematically, capacitance is actually the ratio of charge gained in coulombs per volt that we apply across the plates. So the more coulombs we get per volt we apply, the higher the capacitance and the more charge we can store. So, Coulomb stored per volt applied. So the symbol for capacitance is letter C. Units are farads, where one farad is one Coulomb per volt. And typically capacitance values are fairly small, uh, but they can vary, typically on the order of microfarads or smaller. And I don't expect you to remember the details for this class. But again, if you're curious where capacitance comes from, is capacitance actually comes from the material properties and geometry of our plates. So, you know, we look at the basically how well the material between our plates holds, holds charge and there's also some area and 
distance dependence. So depending on the material we're working with and the geometry of our capacitor, we can get a specified capacitance value. Okay, so capacitance is nice. Uh, so how do we measure it? So typically when we work with capacitors, they're categorized or classified by the material that we use between the plates. That's this dielectric. So whatever materials between the plates, sometimes it's just air, sometimes there's electrolytes, ceramic, other materials. And most capacitors are unpolarized, meaning it doesn't matter which plate receives the charge. Doesn't matter which plate receives the positive polarity. You know, you could apply the voltage either way. However, some capacitors will be polarized meaning there is a dedicated positive terminal. So be careful when working with capacitors. Notice that if you do have a electrolytic or polarized capacitor, you'll need to check carefully on the case of the capacitor and notice that the arrow will point to the negative end of the capacitor. So you want to make sure that you always connect your capacitor in the correct direction. And if you're using an electrolytic capacitor, definitely check for that error. And if we actually want to measure capacitance in the lab, we use a thing called an LCR meter. Here L stands for inductance. C stands for capacitance and R stands for resistance. So LCR meter is able to measure the capacitance of a given circuit element. All right, so now that we've introduced capacitors, let's learn about our new capacitor tools that we'll use for the next part of the class. These are very important equations. So definitely write these down. Write these down and keep them handy. We're gonna be using these basically for the rest of the course. These are super important equations. So keep them handy as you go through the next few videos and our homework problems. So first equation is charge stored by a capacitor. So we remember that capacitance C is basically equal to the charge stored divided by the volts applied. So from that definition of capacitance, we see that we can determine how much charge we're storing by multiplying voltage times capacitance. And then next we can actually determine the current voltage relationship for a capacitor. You might be thinking, well, where did this come from? Well, if we know that Q is C V of T, if we take the time derivative, remember current is just the time derivative of charge, we can actually derive this current voltage relationship. So we see that the current flowing through our capacitor at any time t must be equal to our capacitance c times the time derivative of voltage. So basically, in order for any current to flow through our capacitor, the voltage must be changing. Notice that if dV of t dt equals zero, then our current I of t will also be zero. 
All right, so that's a nice equation. Suppose we want to find voltage. Well, if we want to find voltage and we have this current voltage relationship, we can just take the integral. And that will give us the equation shown here for our capacitor voltage. And notice we see that our voltage is just 1 over capacitance times the integral of current over time. And we also need to have some initial voltage at time t0 or time t equals 0. And then finally, well, we know that energy is just the integral of power with respect to time. And of course, that is the integral of current times voltage with respect to time. So if we were to plug current and voltage in to our equation for energy, we will derive this expression, where we see that our energy stored by a capacitor in joules is equal to 1 half times capacitance times voltage squared. And it can also be written in terms of charge. So these are really important equations. Make sure you remember how to use these and remember the units down here. So lastly, be careful of units because sometimes we can accidentally get units mixed up. Especially be careful of millifarads, which is 10 to the minus third farads. And then of course also microfarads is 10 to the minus six farads. And also, of course, just be careful when dividing. You know, if you're trying to calculate capacitance, make sure you divide coulombs by volts. So just pay attention to units as you work with these equations. Okay, real quick, let's just go through a few more important points, and then we'll do our example. So first important thing to note is that capacitors require time-dependent voltage. So what that means is that our derivative of voltage, dv of t dt, must be some changing value. Under DC or steady state conditions, notice that if our time derivative of voltage is zero, our capacitor will act like an open circuit. So at steady state, the current through a capacitor is zero. So very important, make sure you remember that. So once again, under DC conditions, capacitor becomes an open circuit. And next, very important, please be aware that a capacitor's voltage cannot change abruptly or instantaneously. So what that means is if we have a change happening at time t equals zero, suppose we flip a switch and apply a voltage across our capacitor, we basically, we cannot have an instantaneous change in our capacitor voltage. Notice we can have a gradual change where there's some slope to our voltage over time but we cannot have a vertical change in our capacitor voltage. The reason for this is because if dV of dt is infinity, that would require an infinite amount of voltage in order to achieve that change, and that's physically impossible. 
So please be sure to remember that a capacitor's voltage cannot change instantaneously. It can certainly change over time, and we'll investigate that in the next video, but, but at the moment we flip the switch, before and after, our voltage will be the same. All right, let's do a couple quick examples of capacitor calculations before we move on. First example. Suppose we have a 10 millifarad capacitor and we charge it to 100 volts. And here we want to find the energy stored by this capacitor. Well, let's remind ourselves of a few things. Let's first be careful of our units. So remember, 10 millifarads is actually equal to 0 0.01 regular farads because there are 1,000 millifarads per 1 farad. So be careful. Make sure you don't accidentally miss the units there. And we also know from our toolbox, we know that our energy is going to be equal to one half CV squared. Well, we know our voltage, we know our capacitance. So let's go ahead and substitute. So we substitute capacitance is 0 0.01 farads. We substitute voltage as 100 volts, and we determine that we have our energy is 1 half times 0 0.01 times 100 squared. If we go ahead and crunch the math, that will give us 50 units here, our joules. All right, so let's move on to our next example. And this example is very important. In particular, this example illustrates what I call the comparing coefficient method. It illustrates this comparing coefficients method to help solve problems. And we will use this method fairly frequently. So definitely make sure you understand this method. And when you see it pop up, please definitely use that opportunity to practice. So let's give this example a try. We're told that we have a capacitor in this circuit, and we're given the input voltage and input current for time t is greater than zero. However, we do not know our capacitance C. So our task here is to determine our capacitance if we know the voltage and the current. All right, so let's think about our toolbox equations and ask ourselves, what equation in our toolbox what equation in our toolbox relates V of T, I of T, and C for a capacitor? Well, if you take a look in our toolbox equations, you may remember we have this one. That equation with the integral. So we know we know this, right? This is from our toolbox. So our capacitor voltage 
capacitor voltage is equal to 1 over C times time integral of current dt plus B of 0. Well, if we look, we know we can find V of 0, and we know our voltage, so we can solve for C after substituting in the other values. So let's substitute I of T and V of T and find capacitance C. If we substitute, we'll initially get the following. We know V of T is 4 minus 1.25 e to the minus 1.2 T. That is going to be equal to 1 over our capacitance times the time integral of I of T. I of T is that 3.75 e to the minus 1.2 T dt. And then notice we have V0, or V of 0. Well, how do we find that? Let me just plug in time t equals zero to our voltage equation. So we'll say plus our voltage is 4 minus 1.25 e to the minus 1.2 times zero. So notice to find v of zero, plug in t equals zero to v of t. simplify this thing a bit more. So on the left hand side we have 4 minus 1.25 e to the minus 1.2 t. That is going to be equal to 1 over c times our integral. Well the integral of e to the t is just e to the t, but we have that minus 1.2 coefficient. So we need to pull that out. So we'll end up with 3.75 divided by negative 1.2 times e to the minus 1.2t. All right, so at time t equals 0, we're going to subtract minus 3.75 over negative 1.2 e to the minus 1.2 times 0. That gives us our integral. And then we have plus 4 minus 1.25e to the 0. So that's just 4 minus 1.25 here. This e to the 0 is 1. So if we do that, we'll end up here with 4 minus 1.25. simplify this just a little bit more. So if we simplify again, we've got 4 minus 1.25e to the minus 1.2t. And notice in this case we can simplify our integral expression just a little bit. Alright, so after I simplify this top expression, I end up with 4 minus 1.25e to the minus 1.2t equals 3.125 over c times e to the minus 1.2t, that's the negative sign there, plus 1, plus 2.75. So 2.75 comes from the 4 minus 1.25. To simplify further, I'm going to subtract 2.75 from both sides, and I'm going to rearrange these terms, basically trying to combine like terms and simplify further. So if I subtract 2.75 from both sides, my left-hand side 
will become 1.25 minus 1.25 e to the minus 1.2t. And my right hand side will become 3.125 over c times 1 minus e to the minus 1.2t. And I can simplify this just a little further, and I will determine that 1.25 minus 1.25 e to the negative 1.2t is equal to 3.125 over c minus 3.125 over c e to the minus 1.2t. And you might be thinking, well, oh my goodness, we still need to solve for capacitance. How are we going to do that? This is where I would like to introduce the comparing coefficients method. What you can do is you can compare the coefficients on both sides of an equation. For example, if I have a plus b e to the minus 1.2t equals c plus d e to the minus 1.2t, Notice what we can do. We can show that A must equal C and B must equal D. So basically, we can use the coefficients in front of like terms to help us solve equations and find unknowns. So this is a very helpful method. We will use this a lot, so Definitely make sure you remember this. And we can apply this method to our problem that we've been looking at. If we use this comparing coefficients approach, using comparing coefficients, we can compare our 1.25 constant with our 3.125 over C, and we can compare our 1.25 e to the minus 1.2 T with 3.125 over C. So by comparing coefficients, we see that 1.25 is equal to 3.125 divided by c. So if we solve for c, we get that our capacitance is equal to 2.5 farads. So notice how helpful this comparing coefficients method was to help us determine our unknown capacitance. And 
Some of you might be thinking, well, how is this mathematically legal? Well, if we were to have continued our manipulation of this problem, we would end up being able to pull out the terms a little bit more, and we would see that we'd have 1.25 times 1 minus e to the negative 1.2 t, that must equal 3.125 over c times 1 minus e to the negative 1.2 t. So we see that the time-dependent terms cancel, and we recover that relationship that we found earlier. But this comparing coefficients method does come up quite a bit in the future, so please watch for it and use it to help you solve problems. All right, let's now move on to inductors. So an inductor is kind of similar to a capacitor in that it stores energy, but an inductor specifically stores device in a magnetic field. And inductors are also sometimes called coils, chokes, or reactors by other people, other books. And generally we make inductors by taking a coil of wire and we wind it around some sort of core. And the core typically has some cross-sectional area A and we wind the wire n times around that core with a total length of L. And you may remember from physics class that if we apply some current through this wound coil, we can generate a voltage. And so, of course, the symbol for an inductor will be a curly line. And generally, if our current is entering one end of that inductor, we assume the current enters the positive end of the inductor. It's from the passive convention. All right, so just like with capacitors in inductors, we also like to think about how much energy could we store in this thing? And for inductors, inductance is the quantity that describes how well we can store energy. So when you see inductance, you may want to think of induce or influence. Basically, it tells us how many volts we get, how many volts we can store per ampere per second of current change. So notice the current needs to be changing here in order to generate a voltage. Symbol for inductors is L. So again, you don't want to confuse inductance L with current I. Units of inductance are Henry's, where one Henry is one volt per ampere per second. So Henry's is named after a American physicist. And typically, inductance is fairly small, so like millihenries approximately, but it can vary. And inductance physically, again, this is more for your information. I'm not going to ask you this on exams. Physically, inductance comes from the material properties of the coil. So we see it's related to our core properties, how much we've coiled our wire, the length of our wire, and our cross-sectional area. So basically, the higher the inductance of our coil, the more volts we can store in that coil. That's why we get volts per ampere per second as our Henry's units. And once again here, you do want to be careful of units. Just make sure when you're calculating with Henry's, pay attention to like millihenries, millivolts, milliamps. Just be careful to avoid unit conversion errors. So let's talk a little bit more about 
how we actually work with inductance. How do we measure it? Inductors are typically classified by the material that we use in that core. So it could be an air, iron, some sort of ceramic or composite material. And typically we assume that inductors follow the passive convention. So whatever end of the inductor the current is entering, we, we treat that as our positive end. And like with capacitors, we can use the LCR meter to measure inductance. So just like with our capacitors, there are some extremely important inductor equations that we're going to be using for the rest of this course. So please make sure you write these equations down. and keep them handy. These are really important equations that we are going to be using all semester long. First one comes from our definition of inductance. We know that inductance is how much voltage we can store per current per second that we are changing. So inductance is that proportionality constant between voltage and rate of change of current. But then similarly, what if we want to actually find out how much current is flowing through our inductor? Well, we have a derivative, so if we integrate that equation, we'll end up with this expression for current through our inductor. So notice we have some initial current plus the integrated expression shown there. And remember, of course, P is equal to I of T times V of T. All right, and of course, energy is the integral power. So if we substitute in, we can derive these equations for energy stored by our inductor. And we see that our energy stored is indeed directly proportional to that inductance L. Once again, be careful of units when working with inductors, especially those Henry's units. So if you have millihenries, microhenries, make sure you convert to regular henries before plugging into these equations. And similarly with current and voltage, make sure you're working with volts and amps when using these equations. All right, couple more quick important things for inductors. First, Notice that inductors require time-dependent current. Notice what happens if current is not changing with time. Under DC conditions or constant current, also known as steady state, notice that an inductor will act like a short circuit because current is constant. And you'll remember that if voltage is L times di dt, our voltage of T is just going to be L times zero or zero. So at steady state, an inductor behaves like a plain wire. So we are only able to store voltage in our inductor if the current is changing. Next, another important point. We learned that a capacitor voltage cannot change instantaneously. And similarly, an inductor's current cannot change instantaneously. And so once again, we see that current can have a gradual slope, but we are not allowed to have an instantaneous vertical change of current. 
and the reasons are similar as with capacitors. Because a current di dt would need to be infinity for a vertical slope, and of course we can't have infinite current in real life, it's physically impossible. So basically what that means is if we have a change at t equals zero, we know that il of t at time t equals zero minus must be the same as our inductor current at t equals zero plus for some change at t equals zero. So of course, after the change is made for time t is greater than zero, our current might change, but at the instant a change happens at t equals zero, the current immediately before and immediately after that change will be the same. Again, only for that instant. We'll talk later about what happens for when t is greater than zero. Let's try a quick example before we move on. Here we're being asked to determine the equations for power and energy stored in a 0 0.1 Henry inductor. And we are given the current and voltage through that inductor. We're also told we can assume that our current is zero and our voltage is zero when our time t is less than zero. All right, well, how would we find power? Okay, well, we know that power is just current times voltage. And what do you know? We know our current and voltage, so let's substitute. And here we can determine that our power is going to be equal to our current, which is 20 t e to the minus 2 t amperes, times our voltage, which is 2 e to the negative 2 t times 1 minus 2 t volts. So we can simplify this just a bit. Notice that 20 times 2, that's going to be a 40 we just have a t, so we have a 40t. e to the minus 2t times e to the minus 2t will give us e to the minus 4t. And then we're left with the rest of our expression. So therefore our power is just going to be 40t e to the minus 4t times 1 minus 2t watts. So to find energy, we could integrate this ugly thing, or we could use our energy equation that we just learned. Let's remind ourselves about our toolbox equation. We know that our energy for an inductor is equal to 1 half L times I of T squared. Here our inductance is just 0 0.1 Henry's, and we know our current I of t, so let's substitute. And we'll determine our energy is 1 half times 0 0.1 times 20 t e to the minus 2 t squared. If we simplify and square the things inside, we'll determine 20 squared is 400 times 1 half is 200 times 0 0.1 gives us 20. So we have 20, then t squared becomes t squared, and then e to the minus 2t squared will become e to the minus 4t.
So we determine that our energy will have the equation here. And again, these are for time t is greater than zero based on the information given. All right, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions about what we covered so far. Let's now cover a few more important points about capacitors and inductors and how to deal with them when we have capacitors and inductors in series and in parallel. First, let's talk capacitors in parallel and capacitors in series. If we have a set of capacitors in parallel, we can use Kirchhoff's laws to show that the equivalent capacitance, if we were to replace all of these with a single capacitor, equivalent capacitance would be the sum of each individual capacitance. So capacitors in parallel behave similar to resistors in series. And we can show by Kirchhoff's laws that if I have a bunch of capacitors in series and I want to replace with a single equivalent capacitor, the equivalent capacitance will be given by the reciprocal formula, which is similar to resistors in parallel. So just like with our capacitors and resistors, we can show that, e that relation. Or if we have two capacitors in series, then we get the following. So this is a very nice shortcut. All right, so basically capacitors behave the opposite as resistors if they're in parallel or in series. So sometimes it's helpful to do the opposite of what you would do with a resistor. Next we have inductors. And we can show, if we use Kirchhoff's laws, we can derive the relationships shown here. So we can show that if we have a bunch of inductors in parallel with each other, and we want to replace them with a single equivalent inductance, then we use our reciprocal formula similar to resistors in parallel. And the shortcut for two, two in parallel, will also work. And then finally, if you have inductors in series, notice that, again, it behaves just like resistors, where our equivalent inductance will be equal to the sum of the individual inductances. Let's do a quick example of this before we move on. Okay, so let's suppose that we have a bunch of capacitors as shown here. And we want to replace these four capacitors with a single equivalent capacitor. To do this, we need to use the reciprocal equation and the series equations that we covered previously. So let's go ahead and first start by combining the 12 millifarad and 4 millifarad capacitors. These are in series, so that means the equivalent capacitance will be given by the reciprocal. So I'll use my shortcut. I know that my equivalent capacitance is 12 times 4 over 12 plus 4 millifarads which is equal to 48 over 16, or 3 millifarads. So that gives us a circuit that now contains just three capacitors. Okay, 
Now I'm going to combine the parallel capacitors. So I'm going to go ahead and combine my 9 millifarad and 3 millifarad. And to do that, I can just, just add them. So in this case, 9 millifarads plus 3 millifarads equals 12 millifarads. So after combining those two, I'm left with a 6 millifarad and 12 millifarad capacitor in series. So one more time. I need to combine my 6 millifarad and 12 millifarad in series. That means I need to do my reciprocal formula again. And I see my equivalent capacitance, so it's going to be 6 times 12 over 6 plus 12 millifarads, which is 72 over 18 or 4 millifarads. So my equivalent capacitance for that whole circuit is just a single 4 millifarad capacitor. All right, there's a couple more quick points that we want to bring up about inductors and capacitors. First is Ideal versus non-ideal inductors and capacitors. Ideal capacitors are assumed to be two parallel plates with no resistance. So they're perfectly conductive. So in real life, a capacitor cannot have perfect conductivity. There's going to be a finite amount of charge that can accumulate on that plate. So we model a real capacitor as an ideal capacitor with a high resistance in parallel. So current will still want to flow into that, into that capacitor, but there will be some maximum of how much voltage and how much charge can accumulate with that capacitor. And similarly for inductors, we see that ideal inductors are modeled by a coil with resistanceless wire. But an actual inductor is often modeled by an inductor in series with a very small resistor. Because in real life, wires will have a very small amount of resistance. All right, so real quick, let's finish up with a few more important points, specifically about time dependence of inductors and capacitors and how to approach what we call switched circuits. So when we work with circuits that have inductors and capacitors, sometimes we need to solve problems where the circuit has a switch that is flipped on or off. But what I would argue is that if you see a switched circuit problem, you should be happy. And the reason why you should be happy is because you're getting free information about how you should solve that problem. <laughs> 
If you have a switched circuit problem, typically we assume that the switches have been in position for a long time. So we can assume we can assume the circuit is at steady state before the switch was flipped. And of course, if we're at steady state, that means that inductors behave like shorts or plain wires. Capacitors behave like open circuits. So at steady state, the capacitor can be replaced with an open. And the inductor can be replaced with a short. So also remember, capacitor voltage and inductor current these can't change instantaneously. So what that means is, like we said before, if we have a change at t equals zero, we can see that our capacitor voltage and inductor current will be unchanged at the instant before and after a switch is flipped. We'll do a switched circuit example in just a moment, and you'll see that these assumptions will greatly simplify switched circuit questions. All right, so real quick, before we do our switched circuit, I just wanted to bring up one other useful application where we use inductors and capacitors. And it turns out one common area where they're used in electronics is we can actually use capacitors to make op-amp circuits that can do integrals and derivatives. And so in this example, you see that these op-amp circuits can take some input voltage V of T, and by using a capacitor, we can take a derivative or an integral of our input voltage. So we'll, we'll return to this a bit later and see how capacitors can actually be incredibly useful and inductors as well. All right, so let's go ahead and finish with our last example for today. This is an example of a switched circuit. We're told that we open the switch at time t equals zero. And our task is to determine the capacitor voltage and inductor current, that's Vc of t and Il of t. And we want to determine capacitor voltage and inductor current immediately before and immediately after the switch opens. Since the switch is opened at time t equals zero, we need to find Vc of t and Il of t at time t equals zero minus and t equals zero plus. Remember, zero minus is the instant before the switch was flipped, and t equals zero plus is the instant after. Well, you'll remember, I told you that if you see a switched circuit, you should be happy. And the reason is we can make some assumptions 
to simplify this problem. Do you remember what those assumptions are? Let's briefly review. So the first thing that we're going to assume, first reason why we should be happy, is that we can assume that the circuit is initially at steady state. So initially we're at steady state until the switch is flipped. And then the other thing we're going to assume is at steady state, remember our capacitor will behave like what? And an inductor will behave like something else. Remember, capacitor will behave like an open circuit at steady state, and an, an inductor will behave like a short. And finally, remember that VC, which is our capacitor voltage, and IL, which is our inductor current, these can't change instantaneously. So what that means is in this case, our VC at T equals zero minus, or at steady state, is equal to our VC at T equals zero plus. And our inductor current IL at steady state, or at T equals zero minus, is going to be equal to our IL after the switch is flipped. So here's our recommended approach. We want to draw the circuit at steady state. We can find our IL of T and VC of T at T equals zero minus. And then we know that IL of t equals zero plus and vc t equals zero plus will be equal to those values. So this, this question is actually pretty straightforward. Let's draw our circuit at steady state and see what we get. So if that's steady state, remember our capacitor becomes an open and our inductor becomes a short. So switch, notice our switch is still closed because we're at T equals zero minus. So our switch is closed. We have an open for our capacitor. And notice our inductor becomes a short. And now, of course, our task is to determine Vc of t and our current IL of T. Well, in this case, notice our circuit is just one big loop. 
So notice, I L of T is just going to be our voltage, which is 10 volts, divided by our resistance, which is 3 ohms plus 2 ohms. That gives us 10 volts over 5 ohms, or 2 amps. And next, notice Vc of t is going to be equal to the voltage across the 3 ohm resistor. So we could use voltage division or Ohm's law here. And we determine that Vc of t is going to be, in this case, 3 ohms times 2 amps, or 6 volts. And we know, oops, notice here that t, it's actually t equals 0 minus, and here IL is at t equals 0 minus as well. We know that Vc at t equals 0 minus is equal to Vc at t equals 0 plus, and IL t equals 0 minus is equal to IL t equals 0 plus because capacitor, cur capacitor voltage and inductor current cannot change instantaneously. Therefore, Vc we can write that these are equal, so our capacitor voltage will be 6 volts at both before and after our switch is flipped. And at the instant before and after the switch is flipped, our inductor current will also be 2 amps. So notice this is just for the instant after the switch is flipped. So notice this result is only for the instant. Right before and right after t equals zero. So, next video, we're going to learn how to calculate what happens for a time t is greater than zero. So, not just for t equals zero plus, but what happens for any time t greater than zero. So for now, we've calculated the result for this problem right when we flip the switch. Next time, we'll see what happens for time t is greater than zero. All right, so thanks everyone for joining the fun today. Hopefully now you have a little bit better understanding of how inductors and capacitors work. And make sure you keep those new equations and tools handy. We're going to be using our inductor and capacitor equations for the rest of this course. They're extremely important, so please keep them handy. And finally, hopefully now you also can recognize a few more real world applications of capacitors and inductors. And next time, we're going to take a closer look at how to calculate the behavior over extended periods of time, not just at t equals 0 plus and t equals 0 minus. So thanks everyone, and we will see you in the next video.